também as representações cartográficas da cultura. Gostaria de convidar o professor André Reis Novaes, que vai coordenar a mesa. A professora Carla Lois e o professor Denis Wood para compor a mesa. de sequência à mesa anterior, por isso eu continuo aqui na coordenação. É, essa mesa é uma mesa que eu queria muito que existisse nesse simpósio, porque é, está vendo pesquisadores de ponta trabalhando com as relações entre cartografia e arte. É, o Denis Wood é uma referência no âmbito da história da cartografia e a Carla Lodge também, uma referência fundamental para a gente é, pensando em como contar a história dos mapas, como ela tem trabalhado com os mapas. É, infelizmente, a gente tentou muito ter um, uma, uma tradução simultânea, mas não foi possível. Né? Então, eu queria pedir a paciência de vocês, o Denis Wood vai falar em inglês, cada um deles vai falar 40 minutos, especificamente, então aqui a gente vai ter uma apresentação um pouquinho maior. Ele vai falar em inglês, eu vou tentar depois sintetizar muito rapidamente a fala dele. Ao, ao final da fala dele, eu faço dois minutinhos que eu vou tentar passar para vocês, mas aí, qualquer coisa também no debate, sintam-se à vontade de perguntar, que a gente tenta, dentro das nossas limitações, fazer alguma espécie de tradução aqui para também poder responder as perguntas de vocês. Como é que tem muita imagem e a narrativa dele é bem fluida, acho que vai dar para todo mundo entender. Né? E a Carla também vai falar espanhol, mas acho que espanhol todo mundo não vai ter problema nenhum. Tá? É, então, gente, vou passar a palavra primeiro para o professor Denis Wood, é, da Carolina do Norte, e depois a gente dá sequência para o professor Carla Lopes. Obrigado. Because the distinctions we now draw so automatically among these only recently 
discovered discourse functions or evolved discourse functions took a long time to evolve and in many cases have only recently achieved their current forms. Paleolithic peoples bundled these discourse functions together on incised bones. We've been pulling them apart ever since. Elaborating on Paleolithic achievements, people have constructed an ever-widening repertoire of cultural forms. Clothing, ritual, pottery, dance, painting, sculpture, architecture, drawing, writing, books, prints, film, within which they've encoded ever more elaborate communications. Paralleling the proliferation of forms has been a comparable expansion in the powers of sign systems, gestural, sculptural, pictorial, pictographic, symbolic, numeric, syllabic, consonantal, alphabetic, and others often overlapped and mixed up in rich syntheses of functions, forms, and meanings. Among these syntheses, the map is comparatively novel. Most of us use map in a straightforward way to describe an artifact, still very commonly printed on paper and increasingly taking electronic form, that selectively links places in the world, theirs, to other kinds of things, to this is, to taxes, for example, and voting rights, to species abundance, and to the incidence of rainfall. For the purpose of underwriting the reproduction of, or the contestation of, the social relations of power. That is, maps are more or less permanent, more or less graphic artifacts that support the descriptive function in human discourse that links territory to other things, advancing in this way the interests of those making or controlling the making of the maps. Such maps have comparatively shallow roots in human history, almost all of them having been made since 1500. In fact, almost all the maps ever made have been made during the past hundred years the overwhelming majority in the past few decades. So many maps are made today and they are reproduced in such numbers that no one any longer has any idea how many. The maps printed annually by no more than the world's newspapers easily number in the billions. In contrast, the maps surviving from everywhere in the world for all of human history prior to the rise of the modern nation state number in a very inclusive definition of a map in the very low thousands as if all the humans on the planet had made a single map each year, one here, another there, across the preceding couple of millennia. Paralleling the explosion in map numbers has been a corresponding penetration of the map into ever deeper recesses of our lives. If there is some sense in which maps may be said to have existed in the ancient and medieval worlds, they were confined to sporadic, large-scale property control and rare rare small-scale cosmographical speculation functions. This is to say that starting around 2300 BCE, Babylonian scribes made large-scale drawings of temples, houses, and fields that might have been related to property transactions. That during the 8th century CE, Japanese scribes made large-scale drawings of paddy fields to document ownership during a period of intense landholding and consolidation, as well as large-scale drawings of shrines and temples. That from the 12th to the 15th century CE, English scribes made large scale drawings of monasteries, cathedrals, and fields, invariably for planning and legal purposes, and so on. That is unquestionably a very large scale of graphic property control function can be documented prior to the emergence of the modern state, sporadically and discontinuously, in various places around the world. Nor can there be any question that these drawings participated in local property control traditions. But equally, there is no suggestion that they participated in anything like a broader map-making tradition. For example, there were no connections at all to the rare small-scale cosmograms that can also be documented from equally disparate times and places. For example, to the well-known Babylonian world map of 600 BCE. No connections to medieval European map of Mundi, and no connections to oodological world maps, such as the Japanese Gotenjiku Zoo of the 14th century. Again, nobody doubts that these drawings participated in local traditions of cosmological speculation. But again, the lack of any connection to the large-scale property control tradition makes it hard to maintain that there was any sort of overarching map-making tradition to which these drawings could be tributary much less a map-making tradition that penetrated to any degree at all the lives of ordinary men and women. Contrast this now with the radically different situation that dawns with the 16th century when vast swaths of territory were increasingly subjected to systematic surveys 
by no way self-conscious states. In 1559, for example, the Habsburg Emperor Philip II of Spain commissioned a detailed survey of his possessions in the Netherlands. In 1566, of those in Spain. In 1575, of those in southern Italy. And in 1577, of those in New Spain. In 1591, the Japanese hegemon, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, ordered all daimyo to submit summary cadastral maps and records for the construction of a countrywide cadastro. And the shogun, Tokugawa Iseyu, ordered the submission of a second set of cadastral and cartographic documents in 1604. In 1663, Louis XIV's Minister for Home Affairs, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, commissioned the collection of surveys and maps to cover all of France, while in 1666, the governor of Siberia commissioned the mapping of the territories under his control. Most early modern states initiated similar projects. If not all these commissions were completed as initially hoped, for example, Phillips of New Spain wasn't, returns from Hideyoshi's request for spotty. Such efforts very much laid the ground for increasingly comprehensive and intrusive surveys, including the 19th century inauguration of national topographic mapping programs, which were widely completed during the 20th century, as well as the production, to give one example, of fire and insurance atlases that not only posted the ground plans of individual homes, but included the construction details of heating systems. Today, we map the weather in something approaching real time, the location of sex offenders, the historical ecology of Upper Penitentiary Creek, school attendance zones, atmospheric ozone, the conversion of rainforest to farmland, street vendors of Ho Chi Minh City, regularly updated locations of roadblocks in the West Bank, reported instances of the West Nile virus, the tribes of San Francisco, the location of tomorrow's highway construction delays, Zappos Green Horseshoe, cell phone towers, the tax value of homes, bus routes, bike paths, prison expenditures in Brooklyn by census block, consumer preference by zip code. Is there something we don't map? In fact, so pervasive and taken for granted are maps that it is hard to accept the recency and the continued relative isolation of their general use or to appreciate the 17th century explosion in their numbers that we continue to experience today. At the same time, maps became tools for imagining alternative worlds, mostly at the hands of novelists. But in the 20th century, maps emerged in the practices of artists, too. As early as 1516, a map of an imaginary island had been published as the frontispiece, which is Thomas More's Utopia. It was probably too early to expect this to be called a map, and besides, the book was in Latin, so it's called Utopia Insulae Figura, but it's quite map-like. The extremely high oblique perspective is underscored by the ships in the foreground and in the background by the mainland, which seems almost head-on. With the buildings in profile, the island is an almost an axiometric field. Over the next four and a half hundred years, the use of maps to lend credence to imaginary places would explode and with the publication in the middle of the 17th century of Madame de Scuderi's Carte de Tendre in Sedi, the door was opened onto the instantly popular world of allegorical maps, the map of tenderness, the map of the realm of love, the map of marriage, the map of the realm of poetry. Both imaginary and allegorical maps proliferated. In the late 17th century, Johann Andreas Schnepplin wrote about and Johann Baptiste Thumann made maps of the utopian Schlaraffenland. A couple of decades after that, Malthus was mapping an attack of love. In 1726, Jonathan Swift famously published Gulliver's Travels with its maps of Lilliput, Unamun's land. Almost as famously, Robert Louis Stevenson published his map of Treasure Island in 1883. The mapping of imaginary places swelled into an Amazon of flood. The potent example of E.A. Shepard's map of a 100-acre wood in Tower Hall, and especially J.R.R. Tolkien's map of Middle Earth and The Hobbit, and his son Christopher Tolkien's maps of The Lord of the Rings, inspired everyone with a pen or a mouse to start making maps of imaginary worlds. Maps which turned into game boards, see Dungeons and Dragons, which in turn evolved into map-based video games like Grand Theft Auto, and so into massively multiplayer online role-playing games like World of Warcraft. That is to say, 
into an enormous industry. Marvel Comics, Spider-Man, the X-Men, Wolverine, the Fantastic Four has even published a Marvel Atlas of its Marvel Universe. Yes, with old Afghanistan, Australia, Austria, and so on in it, but with Carnelia too, and Carpathia, Latveria, Lemuria, Madripoor, and so on, with large-scale maps of cities like Boomstadt and Polari. In the latter part of this development, in the early 20th century, artists too began using maps. Every artist has a different tale, but since the 19, early 1900s, more and more artists have had to explain to interviewers how it was they began making art with maps. This wasn't something artists used to have to explain, and it's not like they could point to a long string of precedents. There was earlier map art, and in the precise sense I'm using the term, but not much of it. In fact, map art emerged with Dada and Surrealism, except for the pre-Surrealist Georgia de Chiricos, the Melancholy of Departure, Hannah Hock's Cut with a Cake Knife, 1919, in a fuller rendering, Cut with a Kitchen with a Cake Knife, Dada, through the last epic of Weimar, beer belly, beer belly culture of Europe, is the earliest example I've been able to find. Uncertainty about the date might be that Raul Hausmann's a bourgeois precision brain and sights world movement, also known as Dada Triumphs or Dada Conquers, or his tap mean at home could be earlier. But this wouldn't much matter since Hawk and Houseman were lovers and worked together. In any case, we know a very little earlier map art, and certainly we have every reason to believe that the central motivation was the renunciation of everything that had made World War I possible, of reason, of logic, of the state system the maps to sustain them. The surrealist poet Paul Elouard recalled that he and his friend Max Ernst had been there done together and used to shoot at each other. And their subsequent lifelong friendship powerfully informed their renunciation of a system that in the name of the state had encouraged them to kill each other. Both had been Dada's. In fact, when they first met, Ernst was still Dada Max, and both became leading surrealists as surrealism absorbed much of what had formerly been Dada. Both also proceeded to make map art. Elwar, the 1929 surrealist map of the world, and Ernst, the end of the world allegory, Europe after the rain war. The 1929 surrealist map of the world, Le Monde au Temps de Surrealiste, is without much question the single best known piece of map art. People know it, people wear it on t shirts who have no idea what it is. No authorship has ever been claimed for it or assigned. But it is actually not unreasonable to hazard the guess that it was Elwar. Elwar at the time was the managing director of the Surrealism au Service de la Revolution, for whose pages the map had been originally intended, the map and all the rest of the contents of what instead turned into a special issue of the Belgian journal Valiete, which Elwar also edited. Circumnavigating the globe in 1924, Elwar had spent time in Southeast Asia and the East Indies where he had been angered by the horrors of Dutch and French colonialism. Elwar had reported his route on a map, the Saint Partie de Mon Planisphere, Compagnie Tout, Les Possessions Coloniales, a classic of the era that displayed on a Mercator projection English colonial possessions in yellow, <coughs> French in pink, Dutch in orange, Italian in mauve, and so on. The map must have presented an irresistible target to the increasingly anti-colonial Loire, who in 1929 proceeded to trace over the Cinque Parti and its Tour de Possession Coloniale to create a vibrantly anti-colonial map that not only erased the U.S. and most of Europe, of France only Paris survives, but that wildly exaggerated the size of the South Sea Islands that El Loire believed most capable of disrupting the rationalist hegemony of Europe. The Mercator that Elwar had, all, had traced had already exaggerated the Inuit regions where the Surrealists also saw promise. Elwar also replaced the old equator with a new one, one that greatly resembled the route of his circumnavigation. Is Le Monde de Temps de Surrealiste the first to be constructed as a counter map? That is, not simply appropriated and recontextualized, but made against another map? It's the first I know of. Ernst made his 1933 End of the World Allegory, Europe After the Rain, in response to German propaganda maps, that is, in response to Hitler's seizure of power in Germany. 
which Ernst saw as calamitous. In Ernst's vision of Europe's future, not only has Europe been laid waste, but every trace of the civilization the surrealists detested has been obliterated. The continent itself has been so reshaped that the only, only the title lets us know that this is Europe. When James Joyce saw the picture, he said to have found a play on words which acts as a verbal equivalent, Europe, pure, pure, except that in Ernst's imagination, the fire had been succeeded by a virulent growth that smothered the decomposing landscape, Europe after the rain, too. Ernst continued to use maps in his work, painting Le Jardin de la France in 1962, and collaging elements of maps into such later works as Configuration No. 16, where he was mythologizing aspects of the map other than the portrayal of the state system. He was far from the only surrealist to do so. As early as 1929, 1925, Salvador Dali had made a collage that incorporated map fragments, and in 1939, Dali painted his baby map of the world. By then, Joseph Cornell had begun making boxes that incorporated maps of the moon, the South Seas, and European cities and later he'd worked with world maps, diagrams of the solar system, and star charts. In 1943, Marcel Duchamp had made his Allegory de Genre, plumbing the map, a map of the United States with the head of George Washington. And in, and in, and in some magical year, uh, Joaquin Torres Garcia had made his South Up map for La Escuela de, del Sur. In, 19, in 1950, the letterist Maurice Lemaitre had published Riff Raff, a 10-page metography, which included a sequence that zoomed from the solar system through a drawing of the Earth to maps of Europe, France, and Paris, and finally one of Saint-Germain de Play. More famously, in the later 1950s, the Situations made psychogeographic maps. Guy Debord and his Situations colleague, Gaspar Jorn, made two maps of Paris, the Guy Psychogeographique de Paris, and the naked city. But by this time, map art was beginning to pop up all over the place. And this growing body of work artists were grappling not just with the idea of the nation state, but with that of the region, as Ernst had, the privileged grant of the north, as Torres Garcia had, and zoning and planning, in the case of Herbord and Jorn. More generally, they assumed the power of maps to construe and construct the world they lived in, a world they locked by and large. Robert Rauschenberg had been making art with maps as early as 1956, too. But more notoriously, in the 1960s, Jasper Johns began making paintings of maps. Johns was at the height of his notoriety, and his map paintings were widely reproduced. His largest map <coughs> painting, a mural for Montreal's Expo 67, based on one of Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxian projections, attracted widespread international attention. In a related but highly individual vein, Clays Oldenburg began producing stuffed maps of Manhattan, while Raven Wallstrom worked on board game maps of the world. Fluxus artists, including Yoko Ono, Robert Watts, and George Breck, were making map pieces too, notably Yoko Ono's early map piece and Watts' flux atlas. At the same time, earthwork artists such as Robert Smithson, Walter de Merrill, Dennis Oppenheim, Adrian Piper, Christo and Jean-Claude, Nancy Cole, James Turo, and others began working with maps to plan, execute, and document their work as did, did artists such as Nancy Graves, Susan Hiller, and Gordon Matt Clark. Smithson's map of clear broken glass stripes, that was the last one, with its collaged and pencil drawn maps was a sketch for the outline of Atlantis that Smithson was to lay out in sheets of glass in the Jersey Meadowlands. Piper's parallel grid proposal for Dugway Proving Grounds headquarters used maps to lay out an enormous two-mile square grid proposed to float on I-beams a mile and a half off the ground as the sun moved across the steel beams and would cast a moving coordinate grid over the Dugway headquarters. Uh, Christo and Jean-Claude could never have constructed their landscape pieces from Valley Curtain through 2005's The Gates without maps. First as an essential element of the drawings, Christo sells to raise money to support their projects, then as planning approval and construction documents, and finally as aids to the appreciation of the work. The environmental impact statement for running fence 
for example, ran to over 450 pages, many of them maps. And in the 2005, thousands and thousands of the Gates map were sold to help visitors negotiate the peace in Central Park. With Nancy Graves drawing maps of the moon as in her sweet lithographs based on geologic maps of the lunar orbiter, Susan Hillier performing and drawing dream maps as in her composite group dream map, night of 20, uh, 23, 24 August. And Sola Witt cutting holes in the airports of New York, photographed of part of Manhattan with area between the John Weber Gallery, the former Dwan Gallery, and Sola Witt's residence cut out. Maps were all over the post minimalist landscape. As, as these examples may already have begun to suggest, maps had a peculiar salience in the work of conceptual artists. Artists as well as earth artists of the more conceptual event. Stanley Brown, Ankuara, Douglas Huber, General Idea, Terry Atkinson, and Michael Baldwin, later Art and Language, Ali Gerard Ivoetti, Jean Divitz, Hans Hock, Fiona Templeton, Richard Long, and others all worked with maps the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, some continuing to do so into the present. Stanley Braun began his This Way Brown series in 1961. In these, he asked for directions from passers-by in the form of sketch maps, which he then stamped This Way Braun. More centrally, on Kawara and Douglas Hoopler began making maps in 1968, when Kawara began his I Once series and Hoopler his site sculpture projects. And I went, Kawara would use red ballpoint to trace each day's movements onto photocopies of city street maps, accumulating the maps in a form of self-documentation related to his I Met and I Read series. Hoover's site sculpture projects, in contrast, denoted a site marked on the map as a piece of sculpture. The projects consisted of Hoover's statement, the map, ancillary documentation, and the site, or sites, in the case of the 42nd parallel piece. These were 14 different cities. Some of the artists played with the idea of the map itself. Terry Atkinson and Michael Baldwin made their famous map not to indicate Canada, James Bay, etc. with its endless title and an enframed Iowa and Kentucky. In his Texas gone to Europe, Terry Allen let the place names of Texas run amok over a map of Europe. For many of these artists, the map construed constituted an occasional medium. But for others, making maps became what they did. Aligiero Ivoeti, or Aligiero Ivoeti, is a case in point, or sort of a case in point, because the maps he so famously made were embroidered by Afghan artists, first in Kabul and later in refugee camps in Peshawar, Pakistan. Over two decades, some 150 of the large, colorful wall hangings were made. There are some seven by five feet, all of them identically titled map -up. Boyd began working with maps the same year Atkinson and Baldwin made map not to indicate. But the work could hardly be more different. Boyd's 12 forms in 10 June 1967 were traced from newspaper maps of places impacted by war. Triggered by the 1967 Arab-Israeli War, the first tracing was of a map of occupied territories, a tracing that in turn became his first embroidered work, the occupied territories. That was also the year he made political planosphere, the school map of the world on which he colored in each country with its flag. In 1971, the embroidered occupied territories and the rich, richly colored political planosphere emerged in the first map. Not only a great piece of map art, but one of the masterworks of the conceptual art. Richard Long began working with the maps the same year that Atkinson, Baldwin, and Boyd did in 1967. <coughs> and again, the work could scarcely be more different. 1967 is the year Long decided to make sculpture out of walking. And if his earlier pieces, like the 1964 drawing he made with a snowball on snow-colored ground grass, were completely evanescent, the walks were documented with texts, photographs, and maps three more and more coming to comprise a unified whole. The first piece of Wong's to use maps was Ben Niven's Hitchhike, and the maps have not only remained an aspect of his documentation process, but turned into works of art in their own right. Here's a map of wind directions, according to the compass he was carrying on a 